Chapter 21 I thought I'd wake up feeling relieved the next morning, like a weight had been taken off my shoulders because of the action I had finally taken. But it didn't start out that way, and I wondered while I poked at the scrambled eggs Mom made whether it was something I just was getting used to at first, like a new haircut. It was still really hot, too. Just stepping outside the door was like walking into an oven. I put some ice chips in Tilly's water bowl and fooled around on the computer some, but I didn't exactly race to the phone to tell Mrs. D'Angelo I was home and ready to get back to work. Mom seemed glad to have me around. Why don't you rest up for a couple of days, she suggested, pausing on her way out the door to work one morning. And fold that laundry for me, would you? I did. I folded the laundry, and I took the whole week off. I didn't do anything with the time. I sat around the house mainly, watching television and playing solitaire on the computer. I could tell my father was getting pretty frustrated because every evening he'd come in after being out on the water all day and ask me what I did, to which I had to say, not much. Which, for some reason, prompted my mother to start asking about JT and Digger. It was getting to be a vicious cycle, so finally I did call Mrs. D'Angelo and I went back to work. Mom stopped asking me about JT and Digger, and Dad didn't have to quiz me on what I did all day. Still, things were getting a whole lot better. I don't know. I kept waiting, but I wasn't getting used to the decision that I had made. It didn't feel right. Fourth of July came, and with it, Mr. D'Angelo. I was surprised when I saw his Porsche in the driveway. While I was getting the mower ready, he came out to the garage and shook my hand, but I didn't think he had his heart in it, and although I can't be sure of this, I had the eerie feeling that he was watching me all day. I could barely wait to leave at noon when Mrs. D'Angelo came out to pay me. Her eyes glistened like she'd been crying, and all the way home on my bike I wondered if Mr. D'Angelo suspected me of something. Paranoid. I think that's the word for how I was feeling. Both my parents worked the 4th of July, so I was the first one home. Alone in the house with Tilly, I practically jumped when the telephone rang. I didn't want to talk to anyone, so I let the answering machine pick up the call, and from just two rooms away, I could hear the distinct gravelly voice of Tink Bosley, head of the local waterman's group. Tom, just so you know, there's a meet next Tuesday. Howard's Dock. We're organizing a protest of them new crab regulations. I told thee earlier, but we changed the time. Six instead of five. See y'all there. Thanks. I wondered what the waterman had planned and what Dad thought of this, but there was too much else in my mind, and I couldn't focus on it. At the picnic that evening, my father won the anchor throwing contest his fourth year in a row. Mom soaked up compliments about her blueberry pies, and I stuffed myself on all the good food laid out. But none of my friends showed up. It was strange being at the Rock Hall Marina, given all that had happened there almost three months ago. I avoided the dock area where I'd brought Ben in, and as soon as the fireworks were over, we headed home. In the kitchen, Dad picked up a note from the table, frowned, and rubbed the back of his neck while he read it. I forgot to tell you about that earlier, Mom said as she padded back in the kitchen already changed into her nightgown and slippers. She opened up the cupboard and reached for an empty glass. Tink said the meeting was important. Everybody's got to be there. Dad groaned and Mom glanced at him while she filled her glass with water. I don't think you have a choice, Tom, my mother said. It's America, Dad told her. You always have a choice. Mom's eyes widened. Thomas Parks, she exclaimed. My mom hardly ever raises her voice at either one of us. They'll make your life miserable if you don't go along with that protest. Dad tossed the note back on the table and seemed resigned. I know. The next morning, before she left for work, Mom had asked me to help her plant two purple cone flowers someone had given her at the nursing home. It was another hot day and no sign of rain. Cicadas hummed insistently in the trees and the soil was dry as dust. While I dug two small holes with a trowel, Mom asked me how Mrs. D'Angelo was doing. Well, her husband's back. No, that's wonderful, Mom reacted. Why didn't you tell me? Gina must be thrilled. I don't know about that, I said. She didn't seem all that happy yesterday. Why not? Mom asked. I shrugged. I don't know. Maybe he still blames her for what happened. Mom shook her head. All I can say is that I'm glad that you're over there helping them, Brady. Gina's so sweet with a baby coming, I'm sure she appreciates your help. Gently, I settled the first coneflower in the earth and packed the powdery dirt around the roots. Mom handed me the other flower to plant. Yeah, but I can't keep working for them, I said. Mom leaned forward, trying to see my face. Why not, Brady? Did something happen? No, I told her. A big lie. An enormous lie. 
Plus, I was discovering I couldn't look my own mother in the eyes anymore. I finished patting the dirt down with my fingers, and while Mom watered the plants, I stood up, wiping my hands off on my jeans. I just don't want to be there anymore. I shouldn't have walked away so abruptly after I said that, but I did. Just up and left, went inside to my room, and was thinking the whole time that even if I changed my mind about keeping this whole thing quiet and told the truth, to whom would I tell it? My parents? The D'Angelos? The police? Would it be my word against JT and Diggers? I mean, how could I prove it now that I've gotten rid of the drill? Sitting at my desk, I picked up the old Orioles hat, the one I didn't wear anymore because of Ben, and turned it in my hands. I thought of the red kayak and how I'd seen it sunk on the bottom of the river and stare at the wall in front of me for, I don't know, ten minutes? I knew for I knew I was teetering on some sort of edge. The wallet on the desk opened in front of me. I put down my hat, opened up the wallet, then reached behind the hidden $10 bill for the picture of Amanda. Unfolding it, I gazed at her smiling little face. If you were here, what would you say? I asked my sister. I know you'd only be seven years old, Amanda. You'd be smart like your cousin Emily. You'd have an idea. I know you would. Sitting there holding Amanda's picture, I heard a snuffling noise behind me and I swung around. Mom stood in the doorway, a hand to her mouth. It was obvious she had been listening. I braced myself for her to fall apart, but the amazing thing is, she didn't. Quietly, she walked in, feeling for the edge of my bed to sit on because she didn't want to take her eyes off the picture in my hand. Auntie Janet gave me this, I quickly explained, when I was up there visiting. Tears had cropped up in her eyes. I didn't know, Brady, that, that you ever wanted a picture. Sure I did, I managed to say before my own voice cracked. She's the only sister I have ever had. It was embarrassing for me to describe how we both caved in then and just had it out, crying and hugging each other. All those years we had both missed Amanda so much, and yet we never said anything. It still hurts some when I get to thinking on it, but I try not to go there. So let me just say with one tremendous relief to get it all out that day with my mother. It seems silly, I said to Mom at one point. She's been gone so long. No. No, not silly, Mom disagreed. We can't forget her, Brady. She's a part of who we are. She always will be. I said something, she said something else, too, about how she had to stop blaming herself for what happened to Amanda before she could cope with it and move forward. Then she paused. I knew it was hard for her to talk about Amanda. It was wrong for me to leave and to not be here for you and Dad all those months, she said. I know how badly I must have hurt you, Brady. It did, I readily admitted, because I wanted her to know. I even told her how disappointed I was she and Dad didn't let me go to the funeral, and how I could never go back to the National Aquarium because that was where Carl took me the day they buried Amanda. Mom closed her eyes. I'm so sorry, Brady. It's okay, I told her. Man, I couldn't stand seeing Mom so sad. Hey, I see enough fish around here every day. I don't need to go to the aquarium. She started to smile a little, so I did too. Do me a favor, she asked in a small voice. What? Don't quit, don't quit working for Gina yet. How could I say no to my mom after what we had both been through? Good, she said, and she took my hand. Now, come with me. I want to show you something. Puzzled, I let her lead me into the living room, where she let go of my fingers and lifted to the top of the crystal candy dish on the fireplace mantel. I knew there wasn't candy in the dish, but Mom reached inside and picked up a little gold key. Here, she said. I opened up my hand and she placed the key in my palm. What's this? I asked. A key to the trunk up in the attic, she said. Amanda's trunk. There's a scrapbook in it, lots of pictures, some with you in them. Some toys you might remember. Anytime you feel the need, Brady, you can go up. You know where the key is now. I stared at the key, then looked at my mother. I love my mom so much, I thought, but it would just kill her to know what JT and Digger had done and how it was all my idea. Thanks, I said. I wrapped my arms around her so hard I thought I would never let go.